Amen and amen. Who of you are hungrier? You want more of the Lord? Okay, lift your hands. He's here. Father, I thank you. And in this moment now, Father, come in by your presence. Hops, please. Father, fill this place. Let your people encounter you in this night. Father, as you've instructed me, it's time for empty bowls to be filled up. Vessels to be overflowed once again. And Abba, I pray that right now, that your spirit of gentleness and power will come into this place. Thank you, precious Lord, Holy Spirit, that you fill this atmosphere with your presence. For Father, we have one desire. I have one desire, Lord. And that is to behold you, to know you, to walk in your ways, to do your will, O oh God. We have come to encounter you. We have come to meet of you. Lord, we have come to seek you out. I pray, let my people find you. Let them know you. Let you fill them up in this night. Father, fill us up of your power. Fill us up of the holy anointing. Fill us up of your strength. Fill us up, Lord, with a new authority and a new dignity and a new royalty and, Lord, a new strength inside of us that we will know that our Jesus loves as he is. So are we. Fill this place, I pray, in Jesus' name. Father, I pray, anoint my lips, empower every spirit, every soul. And Father, use us in this night to the glory and edification of Jesus the Christ, our God, our Lord, our Savior. We pray with expectant hearts, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Won't you give Jesus another praise? Amen. You're welcome to be seated. You're not going to be seated long, but you can be seated. I am, I've got so much hope tonight. I, the Lord spoke to me about that you, I need to speak to you about that you are anointed to win. That you are not here to be defeated. You are not here to be conquered. You are not here to be anything but His plan, His purpose, and His answer for this world. Amen? Amen. So I, I, I want to give you just a, maybe I want to change a little bit of a mentality here tonight, and then I'm going to lay hands. I, I'm really trusting the Lord that tonight something very special will happen in terms of business people that are, you know, I'm going to anoint the business people. And I really believe that, you know, the Bible says with two or more agree it shall be done. So... I, I strongly believe tonight as we anoint the business people very specifically, I, I, I think it's time for, for us to have the double portion. I think it's time for the children of God to have the wealth of the wicked. I think it's time that the children of the Lord is prosperous in all that they do, abundantly blessed to overflow. Amen. We're serving the same Jesus. And so I, I really believe that as we're going to pray a bit later, there's going to be unction, but I... I also believe that tonight, really, the Lord wants to speak to you and fill you up. And so I want you to know from the start, I'm going to throw this line out a couple of times, but you are anointed to win more than ever. And in the book of Psalm 119, verse number 24, David says this. It says, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Your testimonies are my delight. You are my counselor. Every single one of you that sit here tonight, you have to understand that you have a testimony. Because you, if you have a testimony, that means somewhere you had to be tested. If you had been tested somewhere for you to have a testimony, that means in the test, something of you died. I want to make it clear just that I love God because if you study the Word, you know, we, you are not a sinner saved by grace, if we understand that wrong, you are a sinner reborn by grace. 
In other words, you have a divine nature inside of you. You are born from a, from a holy God, so you are holy by nature. That means it must be very difficult for you to sin if you are a holy being. Amen? I'm not saying you can't sin. I'm saying it should be kind of very difficult for us to sin. Are you with me? So we have to know that from time to time, God will put us through tests. And the tests are there to refine you. The tests are there to put you into the fire. And the tests are there to bring the best out of you. Let me say it like this. There's, there's two types. And I hope I've got the right crowd here tonight. There's two types of, of people in the kingdom of God. Those that build with gold, those that build with silver, those that build with marble, the Bible says. And then you get people that build with clay, you get people that build with wood, and you get people that build with um, hay or, or stubble. That's the right word, what I was looking for. And what you have to know about this is this, is that, that you won't find a slave with gold. You won't find a slave with silver and you won't find a, a slave with precious stones. You will find them in the rubble. So you have to know that as a believer here tonight, if you want to go higher of God, you have to go through the tests. But the tests are not there to destroy. You know, people have often asked me, why does God test me? Because He believes in you. Amen. Simple. God is such a believer in you. Let me say it like this. You know, people often ask me, why, why don't you talk so much about the devil anymore? Because he's really not that important to set an agenda. <laughs> it's quite simple. You know, he's not that important. He is, let me say it like this, he is a defeated foe. And the Bible says you and I are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's the third dimension. Satan has set us up his kingdom in the second dimension. And we are positioned or located on the first dimension or planet earth. But you have to know that when you rule with Jesus, you don't do it from the first realm to the third realm. You do it from the third realm to the first realm. In other words, I have the mind of Christ. If I have the mind of Christ, that means I cannot have another mind. <laughs> Say it again. If you have the mind of Christ, you cannot have another mind. It's interesting that Satan often wants to give us another mind. What is another mind? Another way to think about it. But if you think with the, the Bible says, change the spirit of your mind. What is the spirit of your mind? That is the renewed part of you, the regenerated part of you. If you start to think with the regenerated part, you will think winning all the time. Because there's nothing that the enemy can do that can stop you or kill you. He might want to stop, but he can't stop really because only what he can only do, he, he can only delay. Let, let, let me throw this out. When, when Satan fell, when Lucifer fell, the Bible says he took one third of the angels with him, right? Okay. Now listen, Adam and Eve was the only two people on the planet. In other words, there was a lot of demons and not a lot of people. Okay. But two people in agreement of God could rule. All the devils. Just two. Okay, we know the story. When they fell, we know that. Now, we have to know when Jesus came, He came as the last Adam. What does that mean? There's not another Adam coming. But if we believe that Jesus only cleaned the slate, that puts us right back into the Garden of Eden. He didn't put you, he didn't restore you, he, rebore, he gave rebirth to you. In other words, he born you from within. I always like to say, I, I journal this often when I say, God is the ultimate body snatcher. He snatches you from the inside out. And he gives you a divine nature. He gives you the nature of Jesus Christ. That's why by nature you should have a default, I want to win. People say, but what if he kills us? It doesn't matter. He can raise you again. Come on, am I the only one here that believes this stuff? Listen, you, you, have to, you have to be quite scandalous to believe the Scriptures. The Bible says so many things that are quite ridiculous. And these, these days we, and please don't quote me wrong. I don't want hate mail again. The, what I'm saying is that if you really read the Bible... 
you'll find that you get some ridiculous stories in there that are absolutely true that many of us in the 21st century today will find it that this can't, can't be God. For an example, have you noticed in your Bible how many times the Bible says that the people rip their clothes off when they want to do something? Now take that into 2019. Every time God speaks to you, rip your clothes off. Can I, am I the only one who reads it like that? Or for an example, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was told by God, lay on your one side for three years. Jeremiah, what are you doing? I'm laying and naked on my one side. God told me to. Sounds ridiculous. What makes Jeremiah, I don't know if I can go there. But you know what makes Jeremiah's story even more ridiculous? Is God told him to make his food over that what was done. Jeremiah, what are you doing? I'm laying on my one side. Why? Because God said I must. Why? How long? Three years. Jeremiah, what am I smelling? It's the Lord said. Come on, think about it. Come on, are you with me? The, what I'm saying to you is it doesn't matter. Even the worst of the circumstances that people can define you in, you are not defined by the circumstances. You are defined by the stances you take in the circumstances. This afternoon as I was praying, I said to God, I, I need, I said, Lord, give me just a voice in this nation that I can be a pure voice unto your people. Because everywhere I see death and decay, but not so for the people of God. Listen, I don't believe we should be a light that hides behind a basket. Because if that is so, we often say this word. We say, the world will grow darker and darker and the church will go brighter and brighter. That is true if you put the light in the wrong place. Because if the church is growing darker or the world is growing darker, that means the church didn't get brighter. Where we should put the light is right in the middle. Let me reword it and say this. If the world gets darker, it's because the church is not doing its job. Oh, come on. We can't have this victim mentality that we say, oh, the world is getting darker. We don't know how we're going to get out of this. No, let the fire burn brighter. Why? We are not set by, even our prayers can't be saturated by the agenda of Satan. We often, let me use an example, we often want to pray in our nation. We see certain things, we want to pray about it. No, before you pray about that, rather pray God's promises, God's prophetic word, God's scripture, and God's life. Because how do you get rid of the devil? You ignore him. He's defeated. He's a defeated foe. You know, in Acts 5, 41, the Bible says, I like the disciples, they, they understood this. They said, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. The disciples had such a victor's mentality that even when they were beaten, they said, we are winning. Even when they were beaten, they were beaten with rods. The Bible says they went out singing. Why? They thought beating is winning. Can you understand that? That the, the but Scripture says that Satan is such a believer in God's Word over your life that he was nowhere on the scene until God spoke. When God spoke, this is my beloved Son and whom I well pleased, suddenly Satan got onto the scene. Why? Whatever God says, he creates. And Satan knew it. And Satan knew if he, if he wanted to take Jesus off his course, he needed to give him something. And what was it all about? It's still about that, worship. He said, if you only will fall down and worship me, then I like Jesus. We misinterpret the scripture. Jesus says, Satan, get away from me. It is written, the Lord, your God. You shall worship the Lord, your God. And him only you shall give praise. 
In other words, Jesus was putting him in his place. He was saying, no, 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 I'm not going to take any shortcuts. Satan, the Lord, your God. You have to understand, let me just say this. You have to understand the demons have not increased from the time they fell. But people increased. That means Satan will not waste his time with people that are not actually doing something for God. Why? They don't have enough resources. I've seen this in visions and visitations. They don't have enough resources. They can only strike at those that are actually trying to do something for Jesus. But whenever, if I can just get this into your heads tonight and into your spirits, if you can just get with me that whenever he strikes, it means it's a compliment. You're actually doing something worthy to be striked. And if you get that type of mentality, you're getting into the winning team type of mentality. Because the Bible says, these 12 men came here who turned the world upside down. World upside down. 12 men, 12 ordinary fishermen boys that believed in, in different ranks and obviously God went to find them. I just want to throw this out. You have to know that Jesus doesn't go find people under trees. Okay, I know, except for... But he found all of the other disciples at their places of responsibility. Why? There's something about your responsibility that tells you how high you can go. That's just free. So even when they, when they were beaten, these, these people said, listen, we have the victor's mentality. The Bible says in Mark 16 verses 15, I, I pray this falls into your spirit. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. I want you to know that the gospel has not yet, has not just been meant for human beings. Because the scripture says, all creatures. <laughs> okay, now you're sitting, you're looking at me weird. If creation was subjected to sin when Adam and Eve fell, Jesus did not just come to restore you. He came to restore the earth. That's why the scripture says that all of creation is groaning for the revelation of the sons of God. Why? Because they, whenever they see the sons of God, they know that they can be free. Free to what? Free to the presence that they were one, once accustomed to. You need to know, if you have no witness, that the creation itself is a witness for you. It looks at you. And it's waiting, it's groaning for the sons of God to be the real. Who are the sons of God? Those that doesn't have a defeatism mentality, but has a victor's mentality. Those that believe that we are anointed to win, we are anointed to conquer, we are anointed to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Anointed for this specific purpose. In Matthew 16, Mark 16, 17, the Bible says the following. It says, in these signs, you can turn there if you want. It says, Mark, I'm just going to be there quick. Mark 16, verses 17, it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, which we will do tonight. And they shall speak of new tongues, which you've done already tonight. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. What is the scripture talking about? Maybe you've wondered. Let me tell you. It means this. They shall take up, or and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. It speaks about dominion over the spiritual world. Cast out devils. Okay, you don't talk to the devil, you cast it out. They shall speak of new tongues, new nature. They shall take up serpents, dominion over the nature of the earth. Not literally to go and pick the snakes up. You know, people do this stuff, they're crazy. That's not what the scripture means. The scripture says you'll have dominion over nature. How do we know? Because the, how could Jesus walk 
on the water. Nature responded to him. You need to understand, whenever you walk as a son of God, nature goes back to its original intent. What does that mean? It means when he put his feet out or his foot out, the water molecules densified. They went back to the original intent and they carried the sun. Why he, and it's, and it's more than that. He has the spiritual world overrides the natural world. And if you live by the spiritual dimension, you can overrule the natural one. You are made to rule and reign, by the way. Many Christians, you know, they want to wait till they get to Jesus to rule and reign. No, that, that's like, you know, eating chocolate at the end of the game. No, you want it now. Yeah, we're going to see him doing it, and we're going to do it for him forever, and we're going to rule and reign over the Lord forever. But I want to rule and reign now because that's what the Scripture says. So when should I take authority over a devil? Now. When should I rule nature? Now. I, I can't wait for the future. It's a now mentality. Are you there? Then the Bible says, and they will drink any deadly thing. What does that mean? It means you have dominion over the biological world. It shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. What does that mean? Dominion over the body. So you've got four areas of dominion. I'm trying to lay a foundation. You have dominion over the spiritual world. You have dominion over nature. You have dominion over the biological world. And you have dominion over the body. So the only thing Satan can do, he can try to introduce you to somebody you are not. Because he know he lost. <laughs> he knows it. So what does he try to do? He tried to disrupt communication between the first and the third round by setting up his kingdom in the second round. But you need to know that Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers and wickedness of high places. That means, listen, there is, if God tore the temple veil in part, if he ripped the thing from the top to the bottom, you must believe that there's no devil in hell that can stop communication between the Father and His children. Are you with me? So what does Satan do? He comes and he tests you, or you go through stuff in life. And what I wanted you to understand tonight is that you have a testimony. You might see some problems in your life. But then you also have a promise. Destiny, problem, and promise. And in every believer's life, you have to know all three of those work together. If you, are, if you stay in your problem, you lose sight of your promise. If you stay in your problem, you will often lose sight of your testimony. That's why David says, your testimonies are my counselors. Okay, the best example I can give you is, is David. King David did this. He said, he, he came to the battlefield, you know the story of cheese and bread, and he faced, he saw Goliath. And he thought to himself, yes, Lord, he, he thought to himself, listen, who is this giant? The scripture says, I want you just to note something. The Holy Spirit just says, I'm going to say this to you. Before you go into a testimony, you always will have a history. Ooh, this is good. You have a history, then you will step into a test to get a testimony, then you will face a problem, and then it will get you to your promise. Okay, now listen, this is the four steps of every believer's life. David had a history with God. Now, you cannot impart your history. The Bible says in Romans 1 verses 12, we may impart spiritual gifts. We can't impart history. But what I can impart is destiny. Because there's no copyright on that. But I can't give you my history of God. I went through it myself. 
So David has a history. I killed the lion and the bear. He comes onto the battlefield. He sees Goliath. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, he is in intimacy with God. Suddenly he faces a problem that puts him in direct conflict with the God that he serves. <laughs> and he, the word goes around that he would go and fight Goliath. You know the story. And so the scripture says that David, the boy, that it travels to Saul, and suddenly David says to Saul, he's in the tent of Saul. Saul wants to put on his armor to him. It's important to note that the reason why that armor didn't fit is because you can't win other people's tests for them or get other people's testimonies for them. You have to go and get your own. So he says, your armor won't fit me. I'll just go over, I'll go over the sling and I'll go over my stones and stuff I know. And then he says this, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. Testimony. Out of a history. Now if you sit here tonight and you've served God long enough, and you will just look back over your life, you will find you have a history of God. That history with the Lord is full of testimony. Your testimony should be your counselors. So whenever you face a problem, you should listen to your testimonies. We don't put our ears to our testimonies. We put our ears to our circumstances. And that's why so many of us are defeated. No, you put your ear to what the Lord has done. And I promise you that you will not be tested according to the Scripture beyond any form of your call or assignment or purpose that is placed upon your life. He will only test you equal to what He knows you can handle. He won't test you more than that because He's your Father. He knows. But David then finds a problem. And now please listen. He has a promise that very few know about. Oh, He has a promise that very few know about. The promise that He has is that secretly he was anointed. You see, God will often anoint you secretly to appoint you publicly. I win much more battles privately than what I'll ever do publicly. Why? The anointing comes in the secret place. The anointing comes where only me and God is there. It's only me to see worship, worship and I worship Him alone. It's only me, only Him to say, see me pray. It's only Him that sees me fasting. It's nobody else. And it's not important that anybody else sees it. But the anointing comes in secretly to defeat Satan publicly. You have to know that whatever you suffer in silence or whatever you go through in silence victoriously becomes a testimony. <laughs> well, for what? For greater things. For greater works. I hear believers tell me all the time, you know, we must look out, the world is going to get so bad. Listen, the Bible says that greater works should still be done. The Bible says this, this, Gospels should be preached to the nations of the world. And this Bible says that every kingdom of the world must acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So I don't, I understand what they're saying, but maybe my mentality is different. I think it's going to get better. Why? There's some pretty good stuff still to come. That means believers must still function in power and authority and in might and in dignity and in royalty like they should. They should cast out devils. They should heal the sick. Greater works than what Jesus has done. And he's done some spectacular stuff. So what does David do? David takes his history. He has a problem. He takes his testimony. And he takes his promise. 
he combines it and he says to himself, the place that I'll destroy this enemy is the place where my history, my testimony, and my promise meet one another. And listen, I want you to know something about the promise. David did not know God was running with him. He didn't. But he had a mentality. And he sling that shot. I want you to think about this scripture. As, this, as the stone traveled and hit Goliath, the Bible says Goliath fell. And then David cut off his head. You will only cut off something's head if you want to be sure it's dead. Come on. So David was victorious, absolutely. But he wanted to make sure that he only needs one. <laughs> Let me use another example. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they see this massive, massive image of Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible says that they refuse to bow down. And they say these words. We often miss these words. They say these words. Even if God does not rescue us, we will not bow our knee. That's a mentality. The Bible says that the, the oven gets or the furnace gets hot seven times. Oh, Christians, listen. Seven times. The Bible says even the Roman or the officers of, of Nebuchadnezzar, they died. It was too hot. And then they get thrown into the fire. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, and I'll paraphrase, how many do we throw in the fire? And they go, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, three. He says, but there's four. And the one that is with them look like a son of the gods. In other words, oh, you need to understand the scripture. In other words, they get thrown into the fire. The fire, the consuming fire. Jesus the Christ, he shows up. And suddenly the Bible says they walk around in the fire. That's literally what happened. And the king that put them in needed to call them out. Because he goes, stand at the mouth of the cave, the Bible says, or oh, that furnace. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, <laughs> come out, please. What happened? Roll switch. Why? People that refuse to bow the knee. People that refuse to quit. People that refuse to worship some other thing. People that refuse to have a victim mentality. I don't know about you, but I can't have a victim mentality. I'm a victor. Everything about my Jesus speaks about victory. Everything about the kingdom of God speaks about victory. Everything. Everything we have. <laughs> so your testimony should be your counselors. You see, let me say it like this. The spirit that is inside of you is not inside of you so that you can live this life quietly. The spirit that's inside of you are in you to live a life out publicly. How do we know? Because Scripture says, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire, they immediately went out. What the enemy is trying to do is trying to make the church huddle together again. That was never the purpose. The purpose is go out. The purpose is be out there. The Bible calls you light. Jesus says, He says these words, I am the light of the world. In John 8. Then in the book of Matthew, He says, You are the light of the world. What does it mean? It means that if your light doesn't shine, and I said that before, 
I don't have a little light. That's an insult. I have a fire. You know, we have a fire inside of us. Not this little light of mine. No, this fire of mine. Because Jesus was such a contradiction. I'll close with some thoughts and I'm going to pray. Jesus was such a contradiction for me. He, he roared and he was silent. He was a king, yet he allowed people to treat him like a slave. Let me just say this. It is amazing for me to think that when that night came that Jesus went to the inn, it was not the first one he visited. It was the second or the third one that he went to that night, his father and his mother, for the king to be born of inn. And it's interesting, when the king was born in that inn, that sometime or somehow by the stars, the Bible says, that wise men came and brought him gifts. I want to submit to you, that I don't think there was any gifts to that inn until Jesus was born from within. There will be no prosperity unless, and no blessing, and no overcoming, and no being the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. If we don't understand, we are born from above and we are born from within. And we have a divine agenda. What is the agenda? To know the Father's will, to do the Father's will, to seek His ways, to know His face, to know His ways, and to do His works. We sang that song just now. No. I hear the chains falling. I don't hear no chains falling. I hear chains breaking. I hear chains snapping. I hear chains destroying, getting destroyed. The Bible says God's, Jesus destroys the yoke. He doesn't come and take some chains off, man. That's an insult to His power. He destroys the yoke. Are you with me? He's violent by nature in that way. He doesn't come to negotiate the terms. He comes to destroy those works. And my prayer tonight is this, that I will ignite this within your spirits tonight, that you will say with me that I'm anointed to win. I'm anointed to overcome. I'm anointed to live the victorious life. I'm not a victim. I am a victor. I am more than a conqueror. Let me, let me just throw this out for you. Quickly go into Romans chapter number 8, verse number 28. Verse number 20. Now, let's read from verse 26. Romans 8, verses 26. It speaks about the help of the Holy Spirit. Are you there? Okay. Otherwise, if you don't get there quickly enough, I'm going to go to my Bible. Oh. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us of groanings which cannot be uttered. Next one. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. The mind of the Spirit. Because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse number 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Why? Why? Have you ever asked the question, why does stuff work for you? It comes in verse 29. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He might be the firstborn, firstborn among the brethren, Verse 30, moreover, whom he called, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse, verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered up his soul, how shall we he not him? also freely give us all things who shall bring a charge against god's elect is it not god who justifies who is he who condemns it is it is christ who died 
and who further is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes also intercession for the saints or for us. As it is written, for your sake we are counted all along, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 8. For I am persuaded, oh, now Paul, he loses himself here. He says, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, please see that, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, it speaks about victory. Come on, church, let's give him some praise. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. I want you to see that scripture. Just quickly go there again. I want to see, let him see this something. You have to know he foreknew you or he chose you before you know you. That's how much he's in control. And then he says, who I called... I justified. Who I justified, I glorified. Now listen, I can get you to victory just by that two scriptures. If you are justified before the Lord, stop acting like you're guilty. Are you there? We walk around like guilty people. I'm not guilty. I'm paid for by the blood. How do we overcome? We overcome by the power of the blood and the power of my testimony. I told the devil the other day, I said, listen, you needed to kill me when you had your chance. But now I'm going to tell everybody you're a big loser. And we're going to take over this world. I'm not here to just survive. I'm here to thrive. <laughs> this is glorified. Glorified. What does that mean? It means you already have the glory of God. You are a carrier. You are a, in the Old Testament, there was an ark. New Testament, you are the ark. Old Testament, the Spirit dwells upon. New Testament, the Spirit dwells within. Old Testament, He came at times. New Testament, you have become His habitation. Oh, if you can just understand how much power and dignity and might and strength and valor and royalty is in your blood. Then it goes on. It says, what then? What then? Shall we say to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's victory. That's winning. Verse 32, 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Listen, I want to give you victory here tonight. Stop charging yourself in front of God. Let me give you a truth of God. When you, when you go and you condemn yourself, He says, what are you talking about? Why? It is God who justifies. So the ministry of condemnation belongs to Satan. The ministry of justification, glorification, belongs to Jesus. Now, I want to throw the last one in your heart. In your heart. You have to know, how do, we, how do we live this victorious life? Go to verse 36. 7, sorry. Yet in all these things we were being born in Congress, I want, actually, sorry, 38. This is how you should live. Knowing that nobody can bring condemnation to you. Knowing that you are free in front of Christ. I'm not saying you can't sin. I'm saying you shouldn't sin because it's got nothing to do with you. Knowing that you shouldn't bring a charge against yourself. There's many Christians here sitting tonight. You are charging you. And you're thinking with all due respect, you're thinking like a loser. 
Stop thinking like that. Oh, come on. I don't mean that where I mean that you have been made to rule. Just because you're silent doesn't mean you're weak. For I am persuaded. Possible. The word persuades it means I know that I know. That I know. That I know. Why those? Let me rank them for you. Why not death? Because Jesus has death. He died for the keys of hell, hates, and death. No life. Why? Jesus is life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No angels. Why? Because angels are ministers unto those that inherit salvation. No principalities. Colossians 2.14, they have been destroyed. No powers, they have been disarmed. No present things. Why? Because everything that you see is fading, by the way. No things to come. Why not things to come? Because when you get to the future, He's already there. Let me, let me throw this. Can I go just one more second? Quickly throw Hebrews 11.3. 11.3. I'm doing a bit of Bible drilling. Quickly do that typing. By faith, we understand that this world were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Verse 4. By faith, go back again. What does it mean? It means everything you live by is in the unseen world. Why? It is the unseen world that you don't see, which you belong to, that overrides and oversees and overconquers everything that you can see. Go back to Romans quickly, Romans 8. I'm closing, I'm closing on this. I need to pray. Romans 8, verses 38. For I persuaded neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present. Listen. If Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers, that means they are unarmed. So who can arm them again? <laughs> the only power they have is what was originally given to them. They don't have more. Now the Bible says Jesus took that too. Now we are seated with Him. So if they get power again, where are they getting it? Can I tell you where they're getting it? They're getting it from the sons and daughters of God that are not living like sons and daughters. If I persuade, verse 39, oh, I love the scripture. Nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing, hallelujah, shall be able to separate us from the love of God. If you understand tonight that He loves you, if you understand tonight that He's for you, I didn't change that tune. If you understand that He's for you, for you, for you, for you, for you, He's not against you. He's not mad. He's not angry. He doesn't want to attack. He has done everything to preserve you. If Jesus sits at His right hand and the Holy Spirit resides in you, and the Holy Spirit can't leave you because He's been called to you. He's a permanent, permanent resident. The Holy Spirit didn't just come to take up some shop and then leave. He came to be with you forever. Why? You are born by the blood. So Jesus sits at the right hand. The Spirit dwells inside of you. What does that mean? It means that the Father stands or sits in between. And Jesus is interceding for you. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you. Have you ever asked the question, why are they praying? They are praying so that the will of the Father can keep on continuing. What is the will of the Father? He wants the world. He doesn't want the church. He empowered the church. He called the church. He predestined the church. He strengthened the church. 
He wants the world. How do I know? He told me, for I so love the world that I have sent my only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in Him shall not perish, but will receive eternal life. When Jesus woke up after death, couldn't hold Him. Jesus messes up funerals. He ruins His own. He wakes up. The, the demons say, isn't this a guy that should have been dead? He kicks open those doors of hell, hates. He takes back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He gives it to the church. He says, now be my ecclesia, be my called out ones. Understand that you are aliens and pilgrims in a time that you will live in. At best, he's numbered your days to 120. And that means that for 120 years, you can live out his purposes and his will on this planet. But when your tent gives out and it will, the only thing that will stand eternal is have you serve the will of the Father. Not the riches, not the testimonies, not anything will stand next to you. The only thing that will stand next to you, have you done the will of God? If I do the will of the Father, I don't have time for fear. I don't have time for worry. I have no time for anxiety. I have no time to be worried about what men say or what men agenda is. Because even if there's a spirit working in men, I know that I carry a greater spirit inside of me. I know that He thunders inside of me. Why, I've spent time with Him. I know Him. I know He's more powerful. I've seen Him. I've seen how powerful He can be. I've seen that just by His feet, everything falls. And by, the Bible says, the Scripture says, is he, if He is the head and you are the body, where has He placed the devil? Under your feet. What does that mean? It means stop allowing Satan rent free time in your life. If you allowed Satan in your mind, kick him out. Jesus paid for that mind. If you allowed Satan into your soul, kick him out. Jesus paid for that soul. If you allow Satan in by rejection, bitterness, anger, hatred, violence, lust, whatever, kick him out. Jesus paid for that. The other morning he came to me, he said this, he said, give it back. I said, what? What do you want? He said, give it back. He was authoritative, I'm like, what, Lord, what? I don't know. I was freaking out. I said, what do you want? He said, give it back. I said, I don't understand, Jesus. Do you have everything? I've given you my life. I've given you my family. I, I've submitted all that I am. I've even submitted my dreams to you. What do you want? He said, give it back. I said, what do you want? He said, give me back the worry. Give me back the anxiety. Give me back the fear. Give it back. I paid for it. Give it back. It's not yours. It's paid by the blood. Give it back. I said, oh, God, forgive me. I fell on my face. I said, Lord. How quickly we forget to pay. He said, it's not yours to carry. Give it back. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to believe tonight with all of my heart. I have a dream for my nation. I have a dream for the people of God. And we will stand united and with the authority of love inside of us. That we will pray the prayer that Jesus prayed and live that life that says in John 17 that they may be known by their love. I have a dream to see a nation come to revival, to see my schools filled of light. I have a dream to see universities under the power of God. I have a dream to see businesses owned by Christians making billions and billions and billions for the kingdom of God. I have a dream not to see families broken, but healed and restored and set free. I have a dream to believe that my 
my nation is ruled by God and God alone. I have a dream that it doesn't matter how many times I fall. I will stand up the eighth time and the ninth time and the tenth time. Why? It's not me that lives. It's Jesus living inside of me. Oh, give him glory, give him praise, give him honor. Oh. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. We worship you. Oh, the power of God's on my body. We worship you. Won't you lift your hand? We worship you, Jesus. Father, fill these people. Fill them. Fill them. Fill them. Fill them. That they may know. That they may know. That they may know. That you've called them by name. Called them by name. They are divinely chosen. For such a time as this. Father, Abba, fill your people with power. Fill your people with strength. Fill them, I pray, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. 